Thank you. You're not the, you're not the first person to mix up me and Pastor Zach. Um, but hey, church, it's good to be with you tonight. Uh, glad that you could make it out. Um, how many of you guys, by the raise of your hands, are enjoying the, uh, the Stories of Hope series? Isn't that amazing? Man, uh, God is just so good. And I, I love these because as more, as we kind of put more stories to the forefront on Sunday morning, more and more stories are coming out of God's faithfulness and, and themes, uh, you know, like deliverance and, and, and so many other things. But so I just encourage you to, to invite someone for this next Sunday. Um, this is a shameless plug for myself, so I feel awkward because I'm, I'm going to be preaching, but it's not about me, so come uh, next Sunday morning as well, um, and it's just going to be an amazing morning. So uh, tonight, we continue the series, uh, Surviving the Holidays. Um, how many by raise of hands? You have 100% of your shopping done. Don't be ashamed. You should, you should stand up and clap for yourself. That's pretty amazing. How many of you are like myself? And it'll be, uh, it'll be Christmas Eve Eve, and Santa will go out and do his shopping. That's a little more my taste. Um, but we know uh, the holidays can be absolutely crazy. As I'm talking through uh, this series to, and just kind of asking people, I've just been trying to ask as many people as I can, you know, how's the, how's the holiday season for you? What are you looking forward to? What do you, you know, just asking questions. I'm starting to find out more and more that it, to me, at least the people I've talked to, it's been like a 50-50 split in the middle of I'm very excited, it is, tis the season, you know, family this, family that, it's going to be great. And then the other half is not so great. I'm going to be missing this person at the head of the table, or I split family, or um, just trauma throughout the year comes out during the holiday season. And so I, I didn't realize how many people, um, a lot of time this season is not as joyous as we'd like it to be. And so tonight, I just want to talk on uh, specifically depression, seasonal depression, kind of the surviving the holiday sorrow, sadness, craziness. And if you're in here and you're like, well, I've never struggled with depression, I've never had a problem, maybe you know someone, but it's not about, you know, you would say it's not for me, like this sermon wouldn't be for me, please don't just check out because um, God has something for you tonight and wants to speak something for you. Maybe it's for you and maybe it's for someone around you. But um, I feel like the church does not do a great job of talking about depression. Um, I there's a lot of stigma when it comes to mental health and depression that a lot of times, whether it's on purpose or unintentionally, uh, the church can communicate the fact that if you are struggling with a mental illness or you're struggling with depression, that you have a lack of faith. And a lot of times we, we, we push or we highly encourage, well, just, just you should be praying more. You should just... You, you just gather within yourself a little bit more faith, and it'll just all blow away in the wind. Um, and I know personally that that is not true. I am no psychologist. I'm not a brain. Uh, I don't know all about the brain. I can't even think of the word for the scientific study of the brain. Uh, I am not versed in it. But what I am versed in is the fact that I struggled with depression and to the point where I uh, almost attempted to take my own life and I was put in the psych ward of the hospital for uh, a week or so, uh, and it was a rough time for me. So what I'm not versed in, uh, in, in I have it all together, I am versed in it is real. And there's real feelings and real emotions and real pain and real uh, oppression when it comes to depression. And we see depression just vamp up and rise up during the holiday season, and I'm just going to break down why that may be. And then the second half, uh, we're going to break down how to overcome it um, and then give you an opportunity to respond. And I believe this is why I love Sunday nights. Uh, really, any time that we get to gather and worship, because it's not about what the topic is. It's not about what's the worship set or e even who's around me. It's the fact that I, I want more of God. 
uh, and I can always get more of God if I seek after him. And so even, like I said, even if you feel like, man, this doesn't apply to me, there will be an opportunity for God to speak to you at the end of the service. So I just encourage you to, to take a hold of that. But let's start out by uh, lifting this up in a, in a word of prayer. Jesus, we just thank you for tonight, and I, we pray against any lies of Satan, any schemes that he's, he's working in right now, even to fill people with shame or fill people with confusion or, 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 or just even to check out that temptation. God, I just thank you that you want to speak, and we get out of the way, and we'll be obedient to what you want to do tonight. We thank you, Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Um, so... Uh, Tonight I want to talk through depression, and fundamentally we have to understand a principle about depression is that it is not just a spiritual problem. It's not just a spiritual problem, and that's what I reference to. The church doesn't always do a great job because we make it a 100% spirit problem when we know full well and God's gift to us as, as having amazing brain functions, and not only that, but uh, study of the brain, uh, we know that depression is very physical. Um, now, there's two sides of the coin here where uh, I don't ever want to be up here and so, uh, pretty much give you a self-help talk and say, if you do these things physically, you'll overcome and completely remove the spiritual side of things, because that's not what it's about, one. And two, depression is linked. It is full spiritual, and it is full physical. Um, so knowing full well that, uh, that it is full spirit and full physical stuff going on, I know that the remedy for me to overcome and survive, really, through the holiday season, if it's a seasonal thing or just a constant struggle, I know that I need to do a twofold attack, physical and spiritual. If I do all spiritual, I'm not, I'm not undermining the power of the blood of the Lamb. Don't get me wrong here, but God has given us things that we can control and we can do in our lives to help impact um, health, right? I know on a, just a basic health level, if I eat McDonald's every day of the week and then when it comes to Sunday, I pray to God about all my health issues, there's something there that I can do in my corner, but when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, uh, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus, physical, spiritual, emotional. It is all about Jesus, and we won't overcome anything or survive anything without the blood of the Lamb. Um, and uh, depression is the number one cause of suicide. Uh, 110 people a day in America commit suicide because of depression. It, it's the number one killer of people between 15 to 24, which is twice the murder rate. Um, and most people, this is kind of more suicide side of things, but most people in that position, uh, they don't just want to die. It's not just, I just want to die. They want their pain to die. They want their pain to end. Not their personal life, but they have come to a place and a point and a crossroad and a dead end, I should say, instead of a crossroad where they've come and said, this is my only option. If my pain is going to end, then my life has to end and vice versa. And, and so I'm here to tell you today and proof that there is hope for you. There is hope in Jesus that I would not be standing here today if I followed my own model of if I end my life, I end my pain. Um, and so that is a strict lie from Satan, and he's winning in that area. And so as the church, we need to rise up. Um, it's the number one health problem in the world. Uh, and uh, one out of every eight people are on some type of medication or uh, some type of rehabilitation for depression. One out of eight. Um, and like I said, there's a certain stigma, and when we step into, when, when we're in the outside world, and, and, and I, you, you may run into me at high V, and I have a cold, and I'm kind of coughing, I'm like, hey, hold up, like, I want to shake your hand, but like, I don't want to get you sick. Um, there's, the world knows, all right, yeah, you're, you're, you got a cold, that's, I respect you for not wanting me to get sick, and it's a normal thing. We don't think twice about it, but the second we say, I struggle with depression, there's a certain kind of freak-out moment for someone like, oh, whoa, like, you, 
you must be pretty messed up. And especially in the church world, whoa, depression. You must be filled with demons or something. There's just a, a wrong stigma about it. Um, if, if I were to tell someone, I, man, I struggle with depression. And, and that's why uh, I believe Satan has a chokehold on that in the church because we don't want to ever share about, man, I'm struggling in that way. I'm struggling with my thoughts because of what it will make people think around me. And Satan just has a chokehold in that way. And you need to know tonight that it's okay not to be okay. It's absolutely okay not to be okay. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to be in this place and you say, man, I struggle in this way. It is okay. Because if you look to the left or to the right, that person sitting next to you in the eyes of Jesus isn't okay either. That's why he had to come and save us. And so we are in a hospital right now and you may be struggling and someone next to you may look like they have it all together, but we all need Jesus. We all need this hospital. We all need in some type of way. And so don't let Satan speak lies to you. Depression is real, and it is a real struggle. Even the seasonal of, man, I'm just really struggling right now. I'm just full of sorrow, and it's just controlling me. Um, depression, it, would it break it down? Uh, it's just a mood disorder that is characterized by some different things. Um, that So your mind is acting a certain way that influences your body to act a certain way. We know the mind is so powerful that through some depression symptoms, it can cause you to physically get sick and immune system break down. You can have uh, different muscle tears and spasm just because you're sad. That's the power of the mind. And depression in its whole is just oppression of the emotions. It's just uh, your emotions and your moods are being oppressed. Um, and something I find kind of powerful is the fact that through all these different studies and, and even a ton of stuff into, I was research, researching in the Mayo Clinic, there is nothing that they can pinpoint down to a, a genetic level that says like, yeah, you were born with depression. There is nothing. There's no evidence. They can't find anything in that way. But what we do know is what causes depression is stress, trauma, as I think of all the presents and stuff that I need to do for Christmas, stressful. This season is stressful, and add on a missing family member, add on a broken family, add on any sort of trauma throughout the year, that is a perfect recipe for you to be thrusted into something like being depressed. And so why is that a little bit freeing because biology and genetics are like being handed down for me and as I struggled with it I just thought it was who I was but that's a lie from Satan because now I know that depression isn't something that just hits me it's the response to when something hits me so when I have it's not just I'm all of a sudden depressed you can pinpoint through maybe it's throughout the year maybe it's a slow buildup that comes to a point in my brain where something happens and I become the response to trauma, the response to stress is depression and the response, your body's response to depression has all different things, fatigue, don't want to eat, constant sadness, it, all over the board. And that's freeing for me uh, because if I can, I can learn to know, okay, I have stress, I have trauma, what do I need to do? How do I need to respond? That can help me and be freeing, so powerfully freeing for me. Um, I won't go into the, all the brain functions and get full on nerd with you uh, tonight, but you just need to know that your brain, when re it's responding to stress, has significant impact on your body physically, significant impact. And even on the seasonal level, I'll just give you an example. There's something called the winter blues. And the fact that uh, in winter there's less sunlight, and so your brain responds to less sunlight by saying, oh, it must be more time for sleep. So I'm gonna re re release melatonin from my brain that causes me to feel fatigued because it's setting me up to go to sleep. Winter blues, that's, that's the power of your brain just responding to the outside environment. 
So what does that tell me? That our outside surroundings and our environments absolutely influence what's going on in here. And if, I, what's go, if this is influencing me negatively in here, then negative here is going to influence my whole body, going to influence my outlook, going to influence everything about me. This, this quote by a, a clinical psychologist, uh, Dr. Joshua Klapow, says, we absolutely have the ability to turn ourselves into individuals with constant anxiety, a depressed mood, an angry outlook, and a pessimistic view of the world. Our thoughts drive our emotional experience. When we have thoughts of doubt, sadness, fear, frustration, our mood changes, thus influencing our body changes. This is why Satan attacks your brain. This is why he attacks your thoughts. He knows what the gift that our brains are to our bodies, the power of it. That's why we see all through the scripture, the, 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 the talk of Paul saying, hey, control your thoughts. Bring, make them obedient to Christ. You need to make them obedient to what he wants because they'll influence you. That's why Satan, his main tactic is lying to you. Proverbs 23, 7, it says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. That's telling me if I'm thinking a certain direction, I'm going a certain direction. If I'm thinking an opposite direction, I'm going to be pulled in that direction. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. That word heart in both those, it's the same interchangeable word for mind. Guard your mind. Lamentations 3.17, I've been deprived of peace I've forgotten what prosperity is, so I say my splendor is gone, all that I have hoped from the Lord, and all that I have hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall, I well remember them. Then, look at this, and my soul is downcast within me. We see here one of the psalmists saying, man, I'm remembering all these afflictions, I'm focusing on all this trauma, and I'm putting those thoughts in my brain, and I'm letting that take me, and now my soul is downcast. It's influencing. And I love the fact, side note, that all of science right now is pointing directly to the, the Word of God. I love that. Um, the Word of God has already said that, what, what scientists are coming out with with the brain. So our surroundings impact how we think, and how we think impacts how we act, feel, respond. And so if depression is happening in our lives because the way we live and we think, it can be fixed by the way we live and think, right? That's the remedy for it. It's not about genetics or DNA, but it's about surroundings. And, uh, and I'm not saying to anyone in this place that you're choosing to be depressed or you would ever choose those feelings, I know full well the power and the oppression that those have on you, especially during a season like this in the holidays. It just amplifies. Um, but this should give you hope that there is a remedy for you to overcome. The Bible has a lot to say actually about sorrow and, and depression. And there's some champions of faith like King David and Elijah that struggled with deep sorrow uh, and depression. And uh, we'll pick up in 1 Kings 19. Elijah had a standoff with the prophets of Baal. Uh, we know on Mount Carmel where he calls down the fire and then kills all of them. Kind of like a high moment, high, high moment, if not the highest of faith in his own life, the biggest personal victory for him as he champions the faith. Um, and then we turn and we see that uh, starting in verse 1 in chapter 19, uh, now Ahab had told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like one of them. She's just sending him a threat, a death threat. Verse 3 says, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he, we, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. You may be in this place, or you may know somebody in this place that have said that phrase. I've had enough. I've had enough, Lord. This is too overwhelming. This is too much for me. I can't do it. 
Take my life, I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. It's significant to me that the biggest trial that Elijah would face followed directly after the biggest victory that he achieved. They're connected there. And a lot of times in our lives that that happens. We can go through something so amazing, God's doing, God's working, and then the next moment, it just feels like I'm in the pit. I'm no better than my ancestors. I've had enough, Lord. And, And so we see this threat, and it caused Elijah to be afraid and caused him to respond. And a couple things just to help you not do or recognize maybe you're doing to overcome depression. The first one is don't, don't, don't be led by your feelings. Elijah gets this death threat, which I know was empty because if uh, Jezebel really wanted to kill him, she wouldn't have sent a messenger, she would have sent an assassin. And so she, he's, it, it, Elijah's having a conversation and this is just threat, 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 and, and Elijah just responds so powerfully to this threat, and, and he was feeling afraid. It says he felt afraid. He was afraid. He had fear, and it caused him to do something, uh, and he acted off his fears. Um, just after God protected him from hundreds of prophets of Baal and in the presence of a hostile nation against God, it just amazes me that th- how feelings can be so real, but they're not true. And your feelings and feelings that you may experience right now or have experienced or maybe in the future will experience, they are absolutely real. The, the fear, the, the, the depression, the sorrow, the confusion, the loss of someone like we talked about this morning, those are real emotions. Those are real feelings. Uh, depression's l- many times uh, associated with shame, anger, uh, guilt. Those are real feelings. I'm not undermining those feelings at all, but they're not true. And Satan uses those feelings and uses those as lies, like Elijah, you're gonna die. I can imagine as he's running, the, as, as he's filled with this fear and acting off of emotion, the, 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 the lies that Satan's planting in his head, God isn't with you. If God was with you, the, this wouldn't be happening. If, it, it, you are a nobody. You should be ashamed of yourself. You are alone, right? The, it, it, and, and those are real feelings, but they're not true. And there's something that uh, in flight school pilots uh, get taught called spatial disorientation. And I'll just break it down briefly. It's pretty much when they're flying and they can't have a full view of the surroundings or they can't see the horizon. And so they get the feeling that they're upside down. And it causes a huge, and I can't remember the percentage, a huge percentage of crashes is because they feel like they're upside down. And so they respond and they react to what they're feeling and it causes them to crash. Well, in, in the planes, they, they don't put one gauge, but they t- put two gauges that say, all right, you're good, you're level, you're fine. And as a pilot starts freaking out a little bit, I'm upside down, I'm upside down, he can look at the gauge that is, remains true and know I'm all right. I am feeling this. Those gauges don't stop how he feels, but it, it lets him know what's real in his life. And it's when they choose to make a decision off their feelings instead of off the gauges in their life. That's when tragedy happens. Um, the truth, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus' truth is that gauge in our lives that we can have. There's people around you that are gauges in your life. That's why do you see co-pilots. Because one guy can be freaking out, and the guy next to him go, you're all right. I know that you're feeling this. I'm sorry that you're feeling this, but you're not upside down. You're going to be okay. God is with you. Look at your gauges. Keep moving forward. Don't respond to the feelings in that way. But so many times we respond to our feelings and false realities of around us, our surroundings, instead of watching the gauges. And that's how it influences our mind, and Satan loves that because he can lie to us, and it changes our whole life. Feelings are real, um, or they're just not true. So what it tells me about them is, is just don't trust them. Don't be led by them. Um, Satan 
isn't a liar, he's the father of lies. So we know that when he plants a lie about your surrounding of what's going on, uh, that Christmas will never be the same. You'll never have joy again in that season. Uh, You'll never have this or have that. You'll always be this way. Um, We can know that that is a lie by God's truth. What he says about us in 2 Corinthians 10, it says we're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I'm taking that thought and I'm going, yes, this is how I'm feeling, but that's not what's actually going on. That's not what's actually true for me. I'm not going to respond to it. I'm going to respond to the truth and make truthful uh, or, or make decisions based off of what God's truth is for me. The truth will set me free. Um, Elijah was afraid, ran for his life, and it says that he left his servant when he got into Beersheba. The second thing is isolation. He left his servant and went out by himself. Satan loves to isolate you. That is the easiest way to bring you down because you don't have a co-pilot. You have no one to say, hey, keep looking at the gauges that God has given you. Keep looking at his truth. You are all alone. You start entertaining a conversation and you start listening to yourself instead of listening to God or the people that God's put in your life. Any, you, you look at any example of nature, they never attack the pack. They always separate, divide and conquer to try to bring you out because you, we know all through scripture that it says two or more, core to three strands. In Ecclesiastes it says a person standing alone can be attacked and, and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even, br- are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. There is people in this church, this family of God, where you may feel shame, guilt of I'm struggling in a certain way. It may not even be with depression, but you have felt that you need to bottle it up and keep it in because you're feeling some type of way, and you know maybe I shouldn't be feeling this way, but Satan wants to isolate you and lie that they will never see you the same again. They're going to respond horribly. They're not going to understand. They're going to always look at me differently. That's how he isolates you. A lot of times I tell our youth kids that when I meet with them and they haven't been around for a while and they're really struggling, I tell them, hey, you know what? The first sign that you're struggling is you stop showing up. Because there's community, there's safety, there's healing here with other people. I find it significant that I, I believe it's in James that we're encouraged to, to, to go to one another to be healed. That there's power in that. There's power in those relationships. And you're not meant to be on this earth to do anything alone. Even if you have lost someone in your life that you're close to, you are not alone. You're not alone. And we're better together. Number three is comparison. So Elijah sits down and he's entertaining these feelings and his thoughts and this conversation. He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Number three is comparison. We see so many times, especially during the holiday season, because we get Christmas cards, we get posts, we get updates, we get this and we get that from people, and we say, man, I'm missing someone in my life. My Christmas is not as good as theirs. My family is not as good as theirs. My relationship is not as good as theirs. My kids are not as good as theirs. My life is not as good as theirs. And we start comparing when we, we, we shouldn't be looking from the left or to the right. We should be looking up in the eyes of Jesus for, de, for de, our dependency on what he has to say about us and who he calls us and our identity in him. Even our, we compare our lives to our past and we say, man, I've done this thing, I'm this, I'm a nobody, I, and we believe what Satan's lying to us, but let me tell you something that's so powerful that Jesus didn't come to this earth just to put the parts or replace parts in your life to make you better. He came to give you a new life and transform you for the old is gone and the new has come. So let me encourage you with this. When you compare yourself to your old self, that is a apple to orange that is you're comparing yourself to a different person because you're a new person in creation in Christ so no longer compare yourself to your past faults even if it was yesterday because Jesus transforms he doesn't just try to fix and build up he gives you new he's fresh 
don't be comparing. That's, that, that's one thing that, that even from the social media side of things, the statistics and, and the amount of research that has gone into proving the fact that social media just has such an exponential impact on leading people to being depressed. Why? Because I'm always looking where the grass is supposedly greener instead of looking for what I have and, and realizing how amazing it is, even in the midst of tragedy. And so, as I begin to wrap up here just a couple minutes and then just give you an opportunity to respond, these are things, as, as we see, this isn't the end of the story for Elijah, and it's not the end of the story for you or for me. As he lay down under the bush, starting verse 5, and fell asleep, all at once the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. One of the things, like I said, there's physical and spiritual a connection that you can do to help uh, alleviate depression or alleviate even just oppression of your feelings, uh, of what you're going through circumstantially and emotionally. Um, One thing that you can do is get healthy physically. Take a nap and eat some bread. That's biblical, right? Gluten-free? What? It's, It's in the Bible. Eat some bread. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) <laughs> but in a very powerful and simple principle, God says before he starts working on Elijah's heart, before there's this mighty move that we'll talk about of God's presence in Elijah's life, he gives him food and rest. That is biblical. That is absolutely biblical. And like I said, there's things that you can control in your life, in our lives, to get better uh, health physically. Physically, there are so many different research, statistics, information that tell me if I'm eating horribly all the time, it doesn't just affect my body, it affects my mind. And there's so many things that, I just saw this study that if you have a normal sleep cycle, and you, because of maybe it's trying to survive the holidays, break out of that cycle, that you are exponentially opened in your mind to depression, anger, and anxiety. Just by breaking a sleep cycle, it is biblical to get some physical rest. Get some rest. Start changing things that you can change. If, it, if you're staying up too late and filling your body with junk, you can change some things in your life to help you feel better and think better and ultimately live better. And uh, um, like I said, it's, it's spiritual, but it's also physical. Continuing in the word, it says, and, and once he got to the cave, and the word uh, of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Even after God giving him these things physically, it, ga- it strengthened him, but he still, his mind, he was still suffering in his mind. Poor outlook, pessimistic. But he's speaking to God. The, the second thing you can do during, when you are feeling that way or feeling oppressed by depression is prayer. Elijah talked honestly to God. Talked honestly to God. And there's so much power about being honest with God. We see prayers all through Scripture of brutal honesty, whether it's King David in absolute sorrow to anger to joy, whether it's Gideon of prayers of kind of doubt, and I don't know God, I just don't know. We see these prayers, whether it's Jesus of just anguish. I'm just, I, I, I'm just dealing with something. God already knows how you're feeling. It's not going to help you to keep it from Him. And to be honest with him. And he, he was speaking and praying to God honestly. Because prayer doesn't change God, prayer changes us. And it will start to change your mind. It will start to change your heart. 
Verse 11, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. I love, this is God's response. It wasn't him talking him down off the ledge or talking to him, explaining him how he just won an amazing victory in front of the whole nation of Israel. He just said, patiently said, just go out, stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. And the wind was there. Uh, after the wind was there, there was an earthquake. The Lord wasn't in the earthquake. Then came a fire. The Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. And I love this. Elijah heard it. Elijah heard it. God hears you, and he wants to give you an opportunity for, for you to hear him to get in his presence. Number three is God's presence. God's presence will help you overcome depression and and survive these holidays. His, His heart is for you to meet with him. His heart for you is to get near and draw close to him. It says that that when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him again, what are you doing here, Elijah? He needed God's presence. I love in Psalm, uh, or it says uh, in Matthew, that God is near to the brokenhearted. He's near to you. Why do you think he uses a whisper? One of the most amazing things about having really little kids around, they think a whisper is putting their tongue inside your head. They just, they get that close, you know what I'm saying? Like tongue in the ear. But there's something special about that because I know that they want to be as close as possible to, to let you hear the whisper because it's all about proximity. And Jesus wants you to be close to him. You may be going through the biggest battle of your life right now, but if you move closer to Jesus, nothing matters what's going on. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in those ways. Psalm 46, 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Is it possible that we will never actually fully know God unless we're still? unless we give our, our, our lives a little bit of the crazy holiday to take a step back and say, God, I'm still before you. You want to whisper to me, I'm close, I'm listening. God's presence, we need it. Worship team, you can come up. He replied, I've been very, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty, and he lists the same exact thing. He lists, he's still in this state of mind. In verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, uh, and Abel, to secede you as prophet. Uh, Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Uh, Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal uh, and whose mouths have not kissed him. The final thing that we need to overcome this, the, these feelings of depression or, or to really get through the holidays and this, this seasonal depression or oppression is God's purpose. We need prayer, we need his presence, and we need God's purpose. Elijah still responds pessimistic. He still responds oppressed. And God just says, hey, I have a plan for you. I have a mission for you. I have a task for you. You're not just wandering around. If you've ever felt a feeling of depression, you just kind of feel empty and worthless. And so God wants to speak to you tonight and give you the purpose that he has for you. Whether you are, are old and been serving Jesus all your life or fresh young Christian and you're not even you don't even know what you're doing for college it doesn't matter God has a purpose for you a fresh purpose that he wants to give to you and it's something amazing happens when we see God's purpose for us is actually for other people it starts to turn your sight from inward to around and, and to other people. And I start seeing other people for the, how they need God and they need something and maybe alleviate my spirit that, hey, I, you know what? I actually have it pretty amazing. I'm struggling. Yes, I need people. Yes, I need God. But God, you can use me in this. You can still use me in this. I can have hope in this. 
and it gives us new direction. And I love that Elijah, there's no response. He just goes, okay, you're right. You're right. Would you stand with me across this place? God wants to give you this confidence and bring you new life and set you free. And like I said, if this, doesn't de- if this message doesn't apply specifically to depression for you, it applies so many ways because we all need prayer, we all need God's presence, and we all need His purpose. And you can have that tonight. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? We have some time here. If you need to go, uh, go with God. And I, but I, I challenge you, whether you do it tonight or uh, here or you do it tonight at home, will you just ask God and tell Him to speak to you, what of these three things do I need more of in my life? Do I need more prayer? Do I need more of your presence? Do I need more of your purpose? Maybe it's all of the above. God wants to speak that to you. He wants to reveal that to you in this gentle whisper because He cares about you and He doesn't want you just to be trudging through the mud. He has purpose. He's got a plan for you. And and I pray that my challenge tonight, that God would speak one of those three things to you or all of those things to you specifically. God, what is my purpose? Maybe your step of faith tonight is just being honest with God for once. Or maybe your step of faith and saying, God, your presence is here, and I'm going to still my heart and hear from you. So I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to go into a time of worship and be led. But I challenge you, encourage you, don't. If you need prayer, if you're struggling, come down to the front, and we would love to pray for you so that you may be healed in the name of Jesus. No shame or condemnation in this place. Like I said, we're all, grace levels the playing field. We're all on the same level and we can all have grace. Jesus, we thank you. We praise your holy name. We thank you that you are in control, and we praise you for this this holiday season. And there's so many mixed emotions, high and low with this holiday season of, I'm missing out on this person, or, or it's just too stressful in this way, or I'm so depressed, I'm so oppressed in this season. Or maybe I just, I'm I'm full of joy in this season. It's a wonderful time of the year. I thank you, God, that we can get more of you. We need more prayer. We need to speak to you more. We need more of your presence. And we need you to uh, instill your purpose for our lives. I pray that we would go hard after you in this moment. We would never miss out on what you have. There's no fear. We proclaim no fear in this place. We thank you, Jesus, for what you want to do. And we thank you that we can just get more of you, God. The more of you, Jesus, we praise you as we sing this in your holy name. Amen. Would you just lift a hand to heaven right now? Just take a moment to still your heart, still your mind in the presence of God. up in heaven, but you sent your spirit to dwell in us and be around us as a comfort, as a guide, as power and strength. You care so much about intimacy. Thank you, Jesus. You love us enough. I pray this season against any sort of shame of struggle that Satan has been controlling and lying so effectively to keep us from true healing and freedom. I pray, God, that during this season we wouldn't be afraid to reach out to a family member or a friend or a pastor or somebody. We thank you, God, that there's strength in that. There's healing and there's power in that. We pray anyone struggling with depression in this place that you would give them freedom in the name of Jesus. We know you're mighty. You can do that in an instant, God. But if it's not in an instant in your will, we thank you, Jesus, that you're in the process. You're with us. We pray for any of those 
here that have lost someone or some sort of family trauma or struggle or separation during this this holiday season i thank you that we can turn to you god in the midst of the crazy we can turn to you jesus for peace and, and we can still our hearts and our minds we just pray that you would you would move more than just tonight that would be a daily occurrence in our lives to seek you every single day Thank you, Jesus, for what you have in store for freshness and for freedom. Praise your holy name. If you want more of Jesus, I encourage you that he's not done. And so just continue to seek him. But if you need to go, just be blessed this week. Find some time to be still in his presence as you pray with him. And discover your purpose that he has for you. We love you. And if you need prayer, once again, we're here to pray with you. Or if you need someone to turn to someone and just reach out, now is the perfect time. We're just so thankful for all of you and thankful for an amazing New Hope family. May you just be blessed as you go and be blessed as you linger in the presence. Just thank you.